Okay, let's get going. A couple of minutes early, give you uh, maximum time. So I'm Cliff Hill from Etron. Uh, we're sponsoring the content theatre today. Uh, we provide a web content management platform uh, as used by some of these wonderful companies. So if you're interested in the technology side of uh, producing content, we're just sat in the back there. Um, so it gives me pleasure to introduce Hugh Jackson from MediaCo, who's going to talk to you about that SEO is changing. So keep up. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, as rightly said, my name's Hugh Jackson. Um, now, the only slide that's going to be selling us at all today is this next one. After that, it's purely educational, and I hope you enjoy it. So just very briefly, if you can bear with me just about ourselves. We've been going since 1999, so we've been around for quite a long time. Um, the book on the right-hand side there is, is actually produced by my co-founder, David Mill, who, um, Content is King. It was produced about seven or eight years ago. Um, but actually, most of the philosophy in it is actually still the same um, today, even though uh, probably some of the graphics and things need to, be, need to change. But well worth writing, well worth reading, I should say. Um, and it's interesting, a lot of people talk about content as king. I remember at a, a conference about uh, four or five years ago, I, my actual title of my, of my presentation was Content is King. And uh, afterwards, somebody half my age came up and said, Content's not king. After the pre on their presentation, it's all about this technology, it's all about this. Well, all the changes that have happened in Google clearly in the last two years are going to show very clearly that content is absolutely king. So when people say they wrote the book, we actually did. You can see there all the various things that we do, search engine optimization, pay-per-click advertising, and email marketing, and blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to go on because you can see it for yourselves because I've been talking long enough. The only thing I would say is we primarily, most of our business is down in the south of England, even though our offices are up, back, up actually in Scotland uh, and Singapore. Long story, don't ask. And if you want to find out why, ask me later. Um, I'm a recent finalist in the chat and shoot marketing wars. Right, that's that bit out of the way. Okay, so some of you may be feeling confused about um, your next steps in SEO because there's been so many changes. Some of you may even feel a wee bit like this. Hopefully after today, you'll feel a bit better and you'll understand the right way to move forward. No matter how you're feeling about SEO, the, the simple fact is you've got to be in the game to, to, to win it. And the great thing about paid search and natural search is that people are actually proactively searching. So it's not a case of like old marketing where you'd send out brochures and, and hope that somebody would um, be needing your services at that particular time. These people are actively searching. So if you're appearing or your competitors are appearing, it's because they're actively searching on a key phrase that relates to your business. So it's the best thing you can get to a qualified lead. And the problem is if you're not appearing, then more than likely your competitors are. So regardless of how you see SEO these days or paid search, it is extremely important to be found in the, in, in the search engine results. Now, I'm going to use this presentation. Um, I'm going to use Panda, Penguin, and Venice updates. Now, some of you might, might be thinking, well, wait a minute. Panda and, Penis was Pe Venice and, and Panda and Penguin were in the last two years. Some of these things happened two years ago. You might say, why are you talking about these things? Well, I'm talking about them for two reasons. One is that they are so fundamentally changed the SEO world. And two, there are constant updates to these things, regular, regular updates to these things, so you, you cannot ignore them. Can I ask you a quick question? How many of you have, have heard of the Venice update? One, top of the class. I'll come on to talk about Venice later, but it's interesting because Venice has really gone under the radar because Panda and Penguin were the big updates that most people um, heard about. So um, hopefully you'll find something useful in that. And then I'll touch on very last, I'll very touch on the Hummingbird, the, the new algorithm, Hummingbird algorithm that Google has introduced in the last month. My colleague Donald, um, who's at the back there, spoke on this subject yesterday for a whole half an hour. Um, I'm going to give it about two minutes. Um, but if, you, if afterwards you feel you want to know more about Hummingbird, feel free to come over to the stand and we can arrange for you to get his PowerPoint presentation. You won't see him live doing it, but you'll get his presentation. What we'll also give you today is a recommended strategy for each of these um, various um, updates um, to take away with you. So hopefully you'll find that useful. And also what, from this, from talking about these updates, you hopefully you will get the answers to these various questions, um, which I won't go through. So the panda update. What was the Panda update about? Basically, Google has had problems with the search engine trying to bring back the most relevant results. And what they were tired of was people with thin, poor quality content, lots of um, sites with 
uh, ads around them all over the pages. And general, I mean, you probably, I used to put a slide up to show some of the really poor quality content that was up there. And it really was nonsensical stuff. And this update has got rid of a lot of that stuff. And what they're aiming for is for you to build up through other things I'll talk about later, build up your authority um, through uh, rel author tags. You build up your authority of your, of your uh, site um, to engage with people so that they see you as relevant for these particular key phrases. So I would suggest to all of you that if you haven't already done it, it's really important you go back and look at your site's content and look and see whether you have got over-optimized content. What I mean by over-optimized is, is the key word that you're trying to be found for everywhere on the page. I, I actually um, was talking to somebody just a couple of, just before the show, on Monday it was, and I looked at their home page and there was a, the key, key phrase to their industry was on that, that home page 40 times, 40 times. Do you think that was easy to read? No, it's not easy to read. So it's about um, writing high quality, fresh content, engaging content. And actually, I've missed a word there, a shareable content. Shareable being through the networks, which I'll come and talk about through social networks. But I, I would seriously suggest you all go back and, and look at for over optimization and, and poor quality. Is it well written? Is it marketing copy? Is it is it written for the search engines or is it written for um, the, the the user? And it should be written for the user. Google is now getting experienced enough and understand enough to pick up what the subject is about. You don't have to mention the key phrase X a number of times. Also look for duplication 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 issues. Um, this particularly happens with content management systems where there's products and it creates unique, page, unique pages for each um, time somebody searches. That actually creates a whole lot of duplicate content. So just look at things like that. The first place to start is typically looking at the, right, what keywords should you be looking at. And we now talk about looking at family of keywords rather than focusing too much on an individual keyword. Think about... Um, I'll come on and talk about this later as well, but think about answering questions for people. The whole hummingbird, uh, hummingbird update, I'm really struggling, I didn't even have false teeth, it's really. Um, the, real, the hummingbird update was all about trying to uh, guess what users, users are, um, are asking about. And so think about trying to answer people's queries rather than simply keywords. But if you're going to use, use a keyword planner tool, the, the Google one's still useful even though we all know the results they give you back in terms of searches are a bit dubious at the best. Um, but in terms of relating to each other, they're still useful. So that's a good tool. Also look at Google Trends, if any of you not use Google Trends. It's quite useful to use Google Trends to see what's trending in your business, in your, in your particular area. Some of you might be thinking already, well, you know, it's all very well talking about building authority and writing about um, engaging content. But you know what, we t we, our business is widgets. That's pretty difficult. But you know what? You have customers. These customers are interested in widgets. So you can still write authoritative content and engaging content for your particular industry. Yes, not everybody's wanting to read it, but for your particular industry, there is something you can write. So, but you've got to start thinking about it. We, use, we, we get brainstorming um, ideas together in the team to come up with ideas for our clients. But you can do that yourselves. And remember, content comes in many guises. It's no longer simply the written word. Yeah, you also got infographics. Infographics is a great way of, of um, that's an infographic there. It's a visual way of telling a story, if you like, or give, providing information. Um, and also video. Video is also a um, really useful way of informing people and engaging people, more so than the written word. And if you are going to use the written word, come up with quite nice headlines. Biggest threat to the economy could be, come from outer space. You're sort of drawn to it, aren't you? Yeah. So just th just use your imagination a bit. I'm not quite sure how you do that in widgets, but you know. So it's all about building authority. Um, I love this, and I always put this in. And I'm, I'm sorry for writing such a long letter, but I didn't have time to write a short one. The point to that isn't that the, a long letter's wrong, because um, you need to have a lot of content sometimes. It's about the fact that. Writing high quality content isn't as easy as you, as you might think. Just because you write lots of business emails doesn't mean you're actually a good writer. Okay. Um, 
social media. Uh, social media is very, very important to increase, particularly your brand awareness, and diversify where your traffic's coming from to your website. So by creating engaging content in social media, um, you are effectively doing that. From a SEO perspective, the jury is out, actually. It used to be felt that social was having a big impact, would have a big impact on uh, SEO. I think the feeling at the moment is that it, does, it has a very limited impact on SEO at the moment. But within Hummingbird, the new search engine algorithm that Google's got, um, the rumor is that they've got a switch in there that can switch on the impact of social into SEO. So I think it's a case of watch this space. Um, and if you create good content, obviously if you create a blog for your site, you want to push that through your various um, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc. But also if you've created high quality content to put out into, into the internet to, get, um, to earn links, also rewrite that content and tailor the message for your individual uh, social networks. I left Google Plus, that, wasn't, that was deliberate. Um, I did that deliberately because Google Plus is quite important. Why? Because Google owns it. Do we think Google is gonna, going to take recognizance of Google Plus? Yes, they are, because it's owned by Google. So if you haven't got a Google business account, you need to get one. And why it's important is Google is trying to prioritize content created by verified authors. The reason why they're doing that is because it's much harder for the spammers in SEO to spam a verified author because they actually have to write good quality content um, to build up their authorship. And um, the way that they do, the way they, basically what you do is you create a real, uh, an, an individual author. So if your blog writer should have um, create a real author tag, and that is a link. There's a link from your uh, blog or your website back to the to the individual author, and they also link back to the website. Um, and they build, they're building up their authority and their presence, if you like, um, for on that particular subject matter or that content. What's interesting about it is it, if it appears in the search engines, what you actually see is you actually get a profile, a headshot of the person, and you also get some, uh, a wee bit of a headline on, from the bit of content from your blog or whatever it is. That improves, that is typically improving uh, click-through rates, but they reckon by up to 40%. So there's two reasons why Google is doing this. One is the one I mentioned, I think, which is that they're trying to stop the spammers. And by creating this verified writers with authority, they're, trying, they're stopping that quite well. The other reason, I think, is, to be honest, um, call me a cynic, but you have to have a Google Plus uh, to do it. So guess what? Everybody has to go to Google Plus to do it. Therefore, Google Plus becomes more popular, and Google becomes more popular. But it is, it is something you really can't ignore. Even though Google Plus doesn't have a strong market compared with Facebook, because of the fact it's owned by Google, you need to do it. So just quickly on Panda, have a content strategy. Why do I say create a content plan? The reason I say create a content plan is because if you create a content plan, then you've built, you're sort of building it into your priorities. If you don't, it's just a case of, oh, we'll write that bit of content sometime, and it'll never get done. So you, by building a content plan, you're much more likely to do it and, and do it properly. As I just, I'm not gonna go through all these because I've, I've highlighted them all already, but utilize the trends. Um, as I said, even in your business, if you think it's not that interesting, other people, your customers will find stuff interesting, therefore there's something to write about. Just have a think about what it is. Write for the content for the users and not for the search engines anymore. and verify your author status using rel author tag. That's probably the key ones there. Right. So, Penguin, who's ahead, who's ahead of the Penguin update? Yeah, quite a few. This was probably the one that had the most significant impact on, on, on a lot of sites. Why? Because they changed, um, they talked, to the links that were previously deemed to be okay were suddenly deemed by Google to be bad. Um, but let's, before we do that, let's just have a reminder of why why Google or Google start to see signals from other websites as being important. There's three things. Is that my phone? There's three things that are important in terms of your 
your search positions. One is your, um, the way your site is structured, which I've not really talked about to, at all today, but it's really quite important, um, how your site is structured and how search engine friendly is. I'll give you an example. We had one client recently where we actually went into their, um, uh, we did a site audit, and we discovered that a site was spamming their site. They'd actually created, they'd somehow got into the content management system, created pages which were automatically shooting off to another site, which were then trying to get credit card payments for Viagra or something. Now, it was obviously a, some sort of really dodgy scam, and they had no idea that this was happening. Now, that's very extreme, but because the content management system wasn't secure enough, it, it was happening. So, I'm, I'm not talking about that type of stuff today, but it's quite important. The other, re, the other key thing that they look for is what you tell them they're about, which is on their webs your website. And that's why the, writing the content on your website is really important. And the third thing they were saying is, well, that's okay. You're telling me that's what you're about. Actually, I want third-party verification of that that, that, that other people think that's what you're about. And that's why they started to talk about um, how many other people and who is linking to you. And that's why um, links were important and still are important. Because they're effectively external votes from other sites. And then the Penguin came along, the Penguin update came along, and what they were trying to do is get rid of what they would call poor quality links. And there was links from, like, links from poor quality sites, um, links from sites that are involved in link schemes, and from different link networks. The interesting one there is actually the, um, they also, sites that had a lots of key links with their key phrase in that link were also um, penalized. And it's quite interesting because Google at one point was sort of saying that that was the right thing to do and then suddenly they just changed the goalposts. So, uh, you know, I have some sympathy with sites that that happened to, to be honest, because um, Google did just suddenly change the, the, the rules overnight. Having said all that, I think the reason they did it is, is genuine. I think what they were trying to do does make sense. So, for once. If you have, I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but... Um, if you have had a penalty of some sort, you can get a manual penalty and you can get a, an automatic um, uh, link warning. And if you did get that or you are, or are getting it, um, then you need to go through a process to uh, try and eliminate that stuff from your site. And there's some useful tools like Majestic and Link Research Tools to identify. It tells you which sites which of your sites linking to your toxic. Really useful tool. We use it um, to have a snapshot for clients, and it's amazing how many clients have still got really toxic stuff in their link profile, and they should be getting rid of them. If it's not penalizing them now, it may well do it sometime in the future. So I'd have a look at that using one of these tools to, to make sure you, you, you get rid of these um, sites. I'm not going to go into the whole disavow thing and, and, and how you go about that. But if anybody wants any information on that, please come and help us. Uh, speak to me at the, at the, at the stand. But you can disavow links, and, and you, but you must do certain things prior to doing that. It's still important. Links are still important. We talk about earning links rather than link building because you should be writing engaging quality content um, that is earning you that link from high-quality sites. The way we do this is we brainstorm ideas. We then research and come up with unique articles or infographics, whatever the content is. And then you need to identify sources or, or resources which um, you can repurpose and share that you've already got. Um, and then you build relationships with these other sites by communicating with them and saying what quality content you've got. Would, the, would this be of interest to you? Because um, these sites are quite often looking for quality content because they don't get a lot of great content. They get a lot of rubbish, quite honestly. So um, that's how you need to earn quality links. It's a much slower process than the old style way, but it will give you a much higher quality link. It's probably the hardest bit of the whole SEO, to be honest. It's the hardest bit of all. Um, and you want to do it on industry-related sites and sites which have got strong metrics, good page rank or domain authority. Um, right, Venice. Venice update was an update they brought in in February 2012, and it was trying to improve the results for the end user by bringing in more and more local results into the search engine results. This is not Google Places and Google Local I'm talking about, which is quite different, which you have to have a, a physical address for. Um, this is on certain types of queries, 
um, they would pull back results. They would understand what location you were in. So if you're based in London, they would bring back a mixture of national results and local results. And you can tell that by looking at the title tags and things. You'll see that many, certain ones of those will be from London, if you're from London, if you're um, Manchester, Manchester. This can have a huge effect on your business, positively or negatively. I'll give you an example. We have a client who's in distance learning, and they've got a key phrase for their most important course. And they got to number one for the UK. Um, but when, what's happened with Google Venice is they've ratcheted it up, so they've included more and more and more phrases. And suddenly, a phrase which is about a, a, a course is now being seen as local, even though distance learning by definition is anywhere. But because the word distance learning isn't in it, it's just the, the, the design course that's in it. What that means is they're now not appearing at number one for somebody in London because they're not based in London. They're now appearing in number position seven. All that traffic they were previously getting at position one, and they were still at position one if you put in UK as a location, all that traffic, they're now at number seven. And they've done, they've nothing, they're still seen as number one in Britain, but it's because Google has now deemed the results to be more localized. They're giving London, uh, uh, particular London sites back instead. So it can have quite a big impact on your business. So um, you need to understand that. Um, just as an example, this is, uh, if you type in chocolate, this is a good example of how you do it. If you type in chocolate shops, um, and you're based in Edinburgh, Hotel Chocolat appears. They've actually got a shop in Edinburgh, and, they, and it appears in, in their number one position. You go to Chester, and they also appear, because they've also got a shop in Chester, and they've, and they've so how did they manage to do that? How have they done that well? Because um, remember, we're not ty typing in chocolate shops Chester or chocolate shops Edinburgh, but Google has de decided that that phrase should bring back localized results. Okay, that's the fundamental difference. How they did it was they created unique localized pages. Yeah, so they created pages which had unique content about the, the town name in the URL, which is great, the local address, the local phone number, map location, and they also had unique content. I like this. This is the, you know, the, a, lo, a little comment from the store manager. What you can't do is have a page for each location, and all you're changing is location name from Manchester to London to Birmingham. No. It has to have unique content. These are the types of areas that it's affecting, but it's affecting more and more as Google is trying to increase the, the, the variety of localized results that it's bringing in. As I said, you wouldn't think for a design course, a particular type of design course, they would bring localized results back, but they, they're starting to do that. And we've got a fencing contractor. Fencing contractor, you wouldn't necessarily think that that would be bringing back localized results, but for certain types of phrases within they're looking for, it does. So you've got to be aware of that. So what do you do if you're not in that location, but you want to be found in London? What you can do is you can create these unique pages. Because remember, you don't actually have to be based in that address, in that location. Unlike the Google Places local, where you actually have a physical address there, you don't actually have to have an address there. And this is quite a, 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 what um, AutoTrader have done is quite clever. They've created pages that are unique. So the, the phrase there is used cars. It's not used cars Manchester, it's used cars. The location that the person is searching in is from Manchester. And what, what Google is bringing back is bringing back an auto trader page that relates to Manchester, right? But they don't actually have a page, a location in Manchester. What they've got is a very good page, which has got Northwest, Greater Manchester, Manchester in the URL. They've got a wee bit of content, not brilliant, but they've got all the, all the second-hand cars are unique to Manchester. So they've actually got really viable, unique content for Manchester. And so the po important point here is you don't have to worry about having an address, a physical address there. You can still create these pages. When you optimize your title, I've not talked about the title tag and all this sort of stuff, how you do this. Um, but the title tag, typically you would, uh, the title tag on, a, on every page, you would want to have your keyword, 
your uh, call to action and a brand. But in this particular case, for these localized pages, you want to have the keyword, the location, and then the brand, your brand, yeah? So that you get the, 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 the location in your title tags, or Google recognizes that you're relevant to that part of the country. So as I said, create localized unique page copy, local reviews, testimonials can be useful, directions, locations, all these different things, even a map is different for different, different locations. And if you can, create a local backlink profile to those particular pages, get some links back to, to your site. Directories have a very limited um, use in SEO these days, but actually for local pages, if you can get some local directory links back to those pages, that can actually be quite useful. Um, because again, it shows that you're local to that, that area. Used um, structured data markup. Schema is, a, is a, a markup process that you can use that Google, Bing, Yahoo, are all are bought into and accept. And it's a, it's a way of telling Google simply and clearly um, what your address is. So that's that just an example of, of it. You need to look up schema to understand how to write it. Um, on the schema's website, but you write it in a certain way and it allows Google to pick up that information very clearly that that's your address if you've got an address in that particular area. Remember that there's an opportunity with, with the Venice update because you're actually, to some degree, if you're in that location, you're reducing the competition because there's obviously not as many companies may have localized pages, so you're actually improving your, your opportunity in that particular area. And use unique landing pages as I've talked about and build some authority to those unique landing pages. If you've got a local address and phone number, brilliant, even better, but it's not absolutely necessary. Okay, um, last is the Google Hummingbird update. Um, this is, sorry, it's not an update, it's a new search, it's a new algorithm, completely new algorithm. Basically, they've, they've They've changed the other algorithms so many times that they've, they've had to really clean it out and, and, and sort it. But there's fundamental changes in it. And they called it Hummingbird because it's of precision and speed. Um, what this is trying to do is to understand more the user's intent, understand longer tail uh, searches better than they have previously. They used to pick up on, you know, if it's the best pizza in London, they would pick up on pizza in London, but not the whole question and the intent of, of the question and this is what they're trying to do with it um, I thought this was really interesting 25% of queries across the world that they see every day are brand new and never been seen never been a query before which I find extraordinary but it shows you the extent and the and the, the long tail if you like and as I say they're trying to get away from results and more towards answers answering people's questions so you need to think about that with your own content thinking about trying to answer people's um, questions rather than simply about keywords as such. Uh, I put this one in just, uh, this is this the nictus from my uh, board, I should say, from my colleague's presentation. Um, the knowledge graph is something fairly new um, and they're sort of rolling it out, so it's not that common at the moment. And what's interesting about this, this is you, you, their Google knowledge graph, and, and so if you now type in the most famous scientists of all time, they, they pull up a whole load of um, people, you can, you can scroll along it to see which scientists you would like to click on. And then it clicks you through to more pages. And even these pages here, these, these links here, this is all on Google. You're not going off to another website. This is all on Google. So Google is trying to get people to stay longer on Google. Well, let's make of that that we will. I, mean, I don't know where that's going. Um, but basically, they are getting people to stay longer on Google, um, which I think interesting. I mean, they're, they're pulling. That, I assume that's everybody else's content that they're using, but they're not wanting them to go off somewhere else. And finally, content is king, but the context of that content is also um, highly important. Use original, high-quality content. Create depth of content on your site. There's lots of ways you can do that through guides, tips, ranks. Um, use visual assets where you can. Have be an informational resource for people in your industry so that they come back to you and they can potentially become a customer of yours. And remember that different messages are required for different audiences and different, and different times. So 
make sure that each of your social networking, you are not just rewriting the same thing, but actually use, utilizing some, uh, make, putting the message so that it fits the audience in that particular time. And finally, um, pick battles big enough to matter, small enough to win. That's just really a little comment to say, I remember, um, oh, it's probably 10 years ago or so, um, somebody came on the phone to me and said, I want to be found for the word Microsoft. And I said, uh-huh. I said, what sort of budget have you got? 500 pounds. And I said, look, you need to join the queue of about 50 billion other people. Um, so the point of the story is Microsoft is actually a stupid thing to be found for anyway in the sense that somebody who's further buying down the buying cycle will actually type in something much more targeted than that. Um, but he's obviously, this small business was never going to achieve that. So the great thing about the internet is it, it is a leveler. You can compete with the bigger companies if you're, not, if you're a smaller business. Um, but the bigger companies are getting smarter and it is harder. So think about the, what it is you're trying to achieve and, and, and be strategic with that. So hopefully if you follow these gu guidelines, you won't feel quite like this anymore and you'll feel a bit more like that. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We've got a minute or two. Any quick questions? Uh, if anybody wants the slides, uh, welcome to come over to the, our stand, which is just, just over there. And, you can, and I'll take your business card and I'll send them to you. All right, thank you. Thank you.